Here are the topics that will be covered in the US pressure groups revision video. This video will focus on the impact that pressure groups have had on US government. Pressure groups seek to influence the way House and Senate members vote. They do this in a number of ways. Pressure groups seek to maintain strong ties with relevant executive departments, agencies and regulatory commissions. This is especially the case when it comes to the regulatory commissions that work for the federal government. It is a moot point of how powerful and influential pressure groups are in election campaigns. Trump received that rel relatively few donations from pressure groups, yet won the election. Pressure groups take interest in the nominations the president makes to the federal courts, especially those to the US Supreme Court. Many pressure groups get heavily involved in ballot campaigns, for example, marijuana use in California. Before we can look at the different impacts that pressure groups have had, we need to think about the three main access points that pressure groups have in US government. They are Congress, Executive and Supreme Court. There is also another access point, which is ballot initiatives, which is a form of direct democracy seen and used in the US. Pressure groups also have an impact on election campaigns. Pressure groups seek to influence the way House and Senate members vote. They do this in a number of ways. Firstly, they lobby members of Congress. Pressure groups make direct contact with members of Congress as well as senior members of their staff. Visit the website of almost any pressure group and you will find directions as to how to contact their members. They give regular updates on the current state of relevant legalisation that is going through Congress. The second way is that they lobby congressional committees. Pressure groups make contact with committees and most of the work of the legislative lobbyists is directed at this sector. Standing committees have significant power to amend legislation, which they consider during the legislative process. This provides pressure groups with one of the most valuable access points into the legislative process. Let's look at some examples of pressure group activity in Congress. Firstly, we're going to look at an example of a Senate committee, and we're going to look at the Judiciary Committee. The hearing that we're going to focus on is the Protecting Older Americans from Financial Exploitation, which was held in June 2016. During this hearing, the pressure group witness called was Joseph McCart, an AARP IRA Executive Council member. Now let's look at an example from the House, looking at the House Judiciary Committee, and the hearing is the State of the Religious Liberty in America, which was held in February 2017. At this hearing, the pressure group witness Kim Colby for the Christian Legal Society Centre for Law and Religious Freedom was called. Another way the pressure groups can seek to influence the House and Senate members is by publicising voting records and endorsing candidates. Pressure groups publicise the voting records of House and Senate members, sometimes offering their own rankings. At election time, they endorse supportive or oppose non-supportive incumbents by fundraising and media advertising. Pressure groups can also seek to maintain strong ties with the relevant executive departments, agencies and regulatory commissions. This is especially the case when it comes to the regulatory work of the federal government. For example, regulations regarding health and safety at work, business, the transport and communications industry and the environment. Problems can emerge when regulatory bodies are thought to have a too cosy relationship with a particular group that they are meant to be regulating. For example, are they acting as watchdogs or as lapdogs? Ashby and Ashford in 1999 identified another close link between producer groups such as companies, labour unions or small business federations and relevant government departments and agencies seeking protection, funding, subsidiaries or price guarantee mechanisms. Pressure groups take interest in the nominations that the president makes to the federal courts, especially those to the US Supreme Court. Pressure groups can hope to influence the courts by offering amicus curiae briefings. Through these, pressure groups have an opportunity to present their views to the court in writing before all arguments are heard. For example, they were certainly active in the Senate confirmation hearings surrounding Robert Borg in 1987 and Clarence Thomas in 1991, as well as those of John Roberts in 2005 and Samuel Alito in 2006. Pressure groups have used these methods to great effect in recent decades in such areas of civil rights of minorities, abortion and First Amendment rights. An example of this is the NRA, who played a significant role in the landmark case of District of Columbia v. Heller in 2008, when the Supreme Court declared Washington, D.C.'s ban on handguns as unconstitutional. Many pressure groups get heavily involved in ballot initiative campaigns. For example, in 2016, Every Town for Gun Safety, a pro-gun control group with millions in funding from billionaire Michael Bloomberg, successfully backed the Question 1 ballot initiative in Nevada, that eliminated loopholes allowing guns to be sold without background checks online and at gun shows. 
Another example of this is in 2008, when many conservative religious groups successfully poured money into supporting Proposition 8 in California, which banned same-sex marriage. It is a moot point of how powerful and influential pressure groups are in election campaigns. Trump received relatively few donations from pressure groups, yet won the election. Many pro-Republican pressure groups have donated heavily to more established candidates in the primaries, such as Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio. Likewise, Clinton received large donations from Democrat-leaning pressure groups via their super PACs and outspent her Republican rival, but still lost. Pressure groups tend to back candidates most likely to win, so in a year of an anti-establishment politics, they have had less of an impact on the final outcome. Do pressure groups tend to back incumbents and why? This is a question we must consider. Arguably, pressure groups' greatest influence on political campaigns and policies is on reinforcing the re-election of incumbents. PACs have one overriding priority, get the most bang for their buck. Hence, business PACs donating 90% of their campaign funds to incumbents. This suggests that many groups' priorities is backing winners and securing access to lawmakers. Candidates who share a group's outlook and values but are fighting an unwinnable race are unlikely to be the recipient of pressure group money.